Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of JVMI, I would like to thank everybody who contributed in today's discussion. You have really enriched the efforts of JVMI and you have enlightened the way forward for JVMI to make sure that this issue does not fall into oblivion. Uh, I would like also to clarify a certain issues uh, related to my person. And uh, this morning, Azada has pronounced some very kind words towards my person. And some of the witnesses also said something that I have become one of them. And a lot of, I face a lot of questions regarding my involvement with Camp Ashraf in Iraq and JVMI today since 2015. The reality is that I had never known the organization of the Mujahideen, MEK. I just have discovered this by accident, by the fact of being the chief of the Human Rights Office of the United Nations in Iraq. And before that, I am from Algeria, North Africa. North Africa is very far from Iran, and culturally, there isn't much to share. And uh, this is why, when I went to Iraq, I was there to do a job for the United Nations according to the mission of UNAMI, which is defined by a resolution of the Security Council and the Chapter 7. When we say Chapter 7, it means it's a uh, binding resolution. But in fact, that resolution had a chapter that makes it for UNAMI to assist Iraq Everything is done on request from the government of Iraq. Meaning that whatever we do is we are there to serve the government of Iraq, which has the uh, custody of the Iranian opposition uh, living in Camp Ashraf in Diyala province in Iraq. Uh, for the, to make sure that we've been doing the job in total impartiality, we don't even refer to them as Mujahideen or uh, members of the opposition. Or we used to refer them to them as the residents of Camp Ashraf, meaning as human beings, that's all. We treated them as human beings and my mission was to monitor and promote the human rights in Iraq, not just in Camp Ashraf. By that position, we had to advise the government of Iraq how to deal with the situation of human rights on its territory. And here comes Camp Ashraf and the residents where we had to make sure that they are treated correctly according to the basic human rights afforded to them. Now, there was a time where politics imposed that we serve the privileges of the government of Iraq before any other humanitarian or human rights consideration. And the UN report from Baghdad was always 
based on those political considerations rather than human rights considerations. And my report on human rights was always carefully edited to achieve that purpose. Uh, I was, I find myself at the end of my mission in Iraq that I am not acting or behaving or doing the job of a human rights officer because the political department of UNAMI will impose that we work for the government of Iraq, not for the basic uh, mandate on human rights. So I was, my mission was reduced to uh, rather camouflaging the violations and particularly those directed towards the residents of Camp Ashraf. And I was pushed to the extent where I had to act while as the Chief of Human Rights Office of the United Nations in Iraq, I acted as a whistleblower to tell the international community that there are crimes taking place in Camp Ashraf. Extrajudicial killings happened in Camp Ashraf. And I was the witness. It happened in 2009, 2011, 2012, 2013, and very lately, they followed them all the way to Albania. The regime has killed more than 100 people, completely disarmed, defenseless. They executed them over 100 and many, many uh, others were maimed and some of them injured for life. And others contracted all kinds of diseases due to all kinds of persecution they suffered. Uh, I would put what happened in Camp Ashraf is part of the or implementation of the fatwa of Ayatollah Khomeini because the fatwa has never been annulled or abrogated. It's still in force. And for those who are familiar with Sharia law, a fatwa doesn't lapse till it achieves its objectives. And Khomeini had made this clear that the objective is to annihilate the opposition and mainly the MEK. So as long as they're there, the fatwa is applicable. And you are very aware of the other fatwa against Salman Rushdie. The fatwa against Salman Rushdie only last year. There was an attempt on the life of Salman Rushdie and he was shot. He survived, but he lost an eye. Uh, that means this is the fatwa, and the fatwa does, need, does not need to be implemented by state institutions. A fatwa in Sharia law is an obligation on all Muslims all over the world. That means anybody could take it upon themselves and go and shoot the person against whom the fatwa was issued. So this is private justice sort of. Uh, this is why uh, on our, uh, on our, on our uh, title of this uh, conference, we spoke about uh, the ongoing crimes. Maybe we need to understand what it means by ongoing crimes. Because, in fact, the crime has started by the issuing the fatwa. It started in 1988. 
and it's continued throughout. It has never stopped. So it, they have to be followed to Camp Ashraf. They were killed in Camp Ashraf. Uh, the demonstrators in 2019, uh, 2020, people went out to the street to demonstrate against uh, poverty, against unemployment, against uh, the, the, the harsh way of living. They were executed. And usually those who are there executed and hanged publicly are members of the MEK. The ongoing crime, who JVMI has been recording, is extending every day. And we could see today that there are still people being hanged publicly, and it's not going to stop there. It's not going to stop there. We will see further executions, further massacres, as long as this regime is in power. And maybe some will ask the question, you held this uh, hearing, the civil society hearing today. We only heard and saw the uh, activists and sympathizers and uh, friends of the Iranian opposition. We haven't seen the other side because a hearing normally is contradictory. Uh, you need to hear from this side and the other. We all know that the Iranian regime is unwilling to cooperate on this issue. So it's impossible to hold a hearing where the other side will also be heard and contribute to, say, their side of the truth. But now, because of the Iranian regime refused to cooperate, and you know very well that the current uh, special rapporteur on the human rights situation in Iran was not authorized to visit the country. And the previous, the previous special rapporteurs to any special rapporteur on the human rights situation in Iran from the beginning of the 2002-2003 uh, were denied access to the country. And the Iranian regime refuses any cooperation with them. So this is why it's impossible today for us to hold a hearing where uh, we gather uh, people for a contradictory debate and hear all, all sides. So we are doing all we could. If the other side wants a hearing, we will welcome that. We want to hear what's exactly they think about what they did against the political prisoners in 1988, the massacres which I personally witnessed in Camp Ashraf. And maybe I should tell you that while the executions in Camp Ashraf were taking place, I went to the people in charge of the security of the security forces in Iraq. I asked them to stop the killing. And they denied that there is a killing while it's ongoing. And I showed them video clips of the ongoing killing. And yet they told me oh, this is just propaganda. So the end was 36 people were killed and uh, I had to send out of Iraq secretly my report to Geneva because the political department would not accept that 
I will send out the truth to the world community. Having said that, we know in JVMI that we, the task is very challenging. When we started it in 2015, we didn't think that we'll reach this stage where lots of issues have been clarified. What we believe is the truth has come out. Is it the full truth, the absolute truth that could be only achieved by an independent international commission of inquiry? That international commission of inquiry is rejected by the Iranian regime. So we have to continue convincing not only the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, and the, the diplomatic community. Because the diplomatic community is also reluctant about following up on these issues. Because when we talk about diplomatic community, whether we like it or not, this is the reality. The states look for their interests before any issues of human rights and democracy. And when I say that, the issue of universal jurisdiction came up. And obviously, in 2016, we tried to study all possibilities, all avenues that would lead to a pro successful prosecution. And we realized that through the ICC, it's extremely difficult. And a referral by the Security Council to the ICC is impossible. So the avenue of the ICC seems to be a serious challenge. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but extremely challenging. We thought at the time that the universal jurisdiction probably would be the most available avenue for pursuing this issue. And uh, we tried. If you remember at the conference, on the, the World Conference on Climate Change in Glasgow, we heard that Ibrahim Raisi was invited to the conference. And we thought that, well, this is an opportunity to put the universal jurisdiction to test. And we went and recorded complaints with the Metropolitan Police in London and we, the uh, uh, Scottish Police in Glasgow, a complaint against Ibrahim Raisi. Now, Really, we face the truth of the, the reality of the uh, state's interests, uh, their political uh, thinking versus their claim of protecting human rights. And we realize that the British legislation gives the, the power to the Foreign Ministry, or the, the uh, FCO, FCDO, or the, the new name of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it's only the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that authorizes the public, public prosecution to follow up on the case. That means uh, we did not receive any reply to our complaint. And this was, the legislation was clear that only uh, if the high interests of the state 
authorize the public prosecution to take place, it, they could do so. That is the same in most of the countries that allow the universal jurisdiction. Uh, there was a breakthrough in the Stockholm uh, uh, prosecution of uh, Hamid Nouri. He was successfully prosecuted in that universal jurisdiction. But it is easy to achieve that prosecution when there is a will of the state to do so. And unfortunately, most of the European countries so far, uh, they are showing some kind of complacency towards the regime because there are plenty of other interests that come before the human rights interests. Having said that, I promise you, JVMI will not give up. <laughs> we will double effort to make sure that we do work at the level of the diplomatic community and it's very important that we invest all our efforts to make sure that there will be a breakthrough through the General Assembly of the United Nations and there will be also breakthrough through uh, the application of the universal jurisdiction and we will remain attentive to all other avenues that will be available. Your contribution today is very encouraging. It gives us new spirit, a new uh, look forward, and I think the presence of the Special Rapporteur and the chair of the working group on enforced disappearances with us today is very, very encouraging. Uh, it will, may, they will make sure, and they already did, that there is a documentation, official documentation of the crimes that took place in 1988 and are still ongoing. So, keeping records and making sure that the documentation and also the evidence is not lost. And you know, in the international community and international law is very special kind of law it develops very progressively. But those of you who remember the 1993 World Conference on Human Rights, in that conference, we were very far away from thinking about prosecuting international criminals. But since the World Conference in 1993, the Humanity had made lots of progress on all levels. That applies to the task we took on board in JVMI, that progressive development will eventually achieve results. And I thank you very much.